Okay, so I, I, um, I'm going to enter into this challenge of trying to draw out some connections or to ask a question that might hopefully uh, elicit responses from, from all of you and maybe remind us also of the presentations we had before lunch. Um, what I found myself thinking is that um, there's been a lot of talk about kind of uh, ambiguity and the, the, the slipperiness of the term disgust and perhaps its, its uh, association or occasional conflation with other terms, be it the, the uncanny or the abject. <laughs> Don't worry, I was just getting started. Um, but at the same time, isn't it... Um, isn't it quite fixed? I mean, isn't there also this sense in which um, its kind of earliest association is something um, uh, that, that Darwin would have seen as being universal or being sort of like primal in some animal sense? That it always, that there's a, a limited vocabulary in a sense of what disgust is and what it associates it with, itself with, which is basically things that relate to. The, in, the, the boundary between the inside and the outside of our bodies and um, I mean maybe I'm just trying to kind of put boundaries around it in order to understand the concept better um, but could you not say that you could almost kind of itemise what the material um, vocabulary of disgust is going to be although its kind of implications might change yes <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> well, as I was working on my piece, I, I kept adding to the list of uh, terms that overlapped. Uh, so you've mentioned abjection and, and the uncanny, but I also had shame and violence. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than try to sort it out or create a schema, I just decided to go with it. But I, I think each of the talks in some ways puts a different inflection and, and I think in terms of what um, uh, Katie's presentation and, and Wayne's, there, there's also that ultimate boundary of death. And I was thinking of Eva Hesse and other work that's kind of the documentation of, of, uh, of dying, of the body decaying. Uh, Please. As I was thinking, trying to put together uh, disgust, um, the uncanny, the grotesque and metamorphosis, mm -hmm. because I think, uh, particularly is that McCarthy, the, the uh, changing of his body by sticking stuff into his mouth and so on, is a kind of mm. metamorphosis. And I was thinking that one way in which perhaps the materiality of disgust does change through time is if you think of the grotesque, it starts off in Greek uh, culture where it's natural kinds that are combined and the, the change that happens in the body uh, is related to animal and plant or uh, different animal types. But we are now living in this um, civilization of consumerism and of ketchup. And I do think that that has produced a big difference in the nature <laughs> of the metamorphoses that come up and of what, how disgust materially presents itself. And if you think of um, metamorphosis um, or of the uncanny now, uh, Freud's original thing, you know, is the das Unheimliche, which is both the secret but it's heimlich, it's at home inside you. And to my mind, some of the things that we've looked at are peculiarly uncanny because it isn't something that's coming from inside you, as Freud argues, you know, that's coming from childhood or infancy. It's all this awful stuff that's outside us that is now, we feel we're made by this, and, and that produces a peculiarly powerful kind of disgust, I think. Good. As I think, you know, some of the the, the performance mm. things bring that. Mm. Your work as well, mm -hmm. I think, is full of that mm -hmm. sort of sense. Sorry, I'm yakking on. No, thank you. Yeah. Um, I was just going to add to that. I guess, mm. um, yeah, thinking about McCarthy's work, um, 
I think he tries to engage both the inside and the outside. I think that's what he's some, something of what he's trying to do in terms of um, engage the gut, engage the moment when at, at some point in the performance you, you'll probably feel sick watching it, but when that moment is might be subjective. For me, it was the, 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 the moment that I picked up. So he engages that, the ins, what might come up from the inside, as well as the images and icons that are kind of in, in the air, in the outside as well. So I, I think that's what he's trying to do, is kind of smash these two things together. That's what he's Unsettle what's inside yeah, and what's think, outside. Yeah. Which you once had a certain sense of, and now mm -hmm. there's this sense that we're, and particularly with developments in uh, machinery and, you know, and body parts now being made with uh, and added to us and so on, the, the, the simple naturalness mm -hmm. of the human body is really disappearing, I think, and I think a lot of the art, that's one of the lines, it's a lot of it, one of the lines that's going on. No, I think, that, I think that's really helpful, especially in understanding um, how Harriet was connecting uh, McCarthy's work to consumerism, because I wasn't quite sort of getting the dynamics of that work, but, um, but I can certainly um, empathise with a sense of greater confusion about what the difference is between me and my stuff or how that stuff kind of invades my life and the particular kind of anxiety which seems to somehow in my subconscious relate to disgust um, that I can sort of, yeah. I can grasp hold of that as a quite One real last change. Thought that menstrual blood is nothing like as disgusting as Heems's ketchup coming out <laughs> of you, you know. Yeah. I'd really rather have the menstrual blood any day. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I would agree with you that the thing that, that the, the only thing that has really made me feel um, that sense of <laughs> the bile rising do it, do it. was <laughs> I'm not going to do it. You didn't bring you didn't bring the uh, peptibismal, so I'm, I'm not going to bring. Customers the wouldn't let me bring it. <laughs> um, was was the, the thinking about the smell of, of tomato ketchup and, and the the thought of kind of swallowing a bottle whole. Um, it, would anyone else like to, to, to offer anything on this? We could talk about condiments. <laughs> we could talk about condiments. Do we talk about relish? Uh, that's <laughs> I want to um, talk about Darwin a little bit, actually, because Please. you said that it sort of seems quite obvious. And to Darwin, I think it does seem quite obvious that disgust is to do with rejecting food that might be bad for us. But even when he writes about that, it already becomes quite sort of culturally mediated, it's ambiguous. Um, is that me making that? It might be, if you've got a phone in the vicinity of a no, microphone, no, it might so be. It's, someone else. <laughs> okay. it's just the microphone. Um, so he writes about um, kind of being in Tierra del, Tierra del Fuego and he's eating some cold meat, and this is where he, this is an example he uses to illustrate disgust. So he's eating this cold meat, and um, one of the natives comes and looks disgusted at it because of its texture. So he's disgusted by Darwin's food and kind of prods it to see what it feels like. And then Darwin himself is disgusted because a naked savage has just touched his, um, his food and now he doesn't want to eat it, even though he adds um, his hands did not appear dirty. Mm -hmm. um, so he's relating this to food disgust and rejection, kind of ideas about how you might catch something, I suppose. But what he's actually doing is showing that um, two people have responded to a sort of focal point of disgust, which is food, in quite different ways, depending on where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's what hasn't changed, if you then look at McCarthy's work, is that he's still using food as that kind of focal point for disgust, but it's being kind of shown and represented and, and experienced quite differently. Yeah, for me it's mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw Undercover Brother and there was a whole scene about mayonnaise, I felt culturally validated. Uh, <laughs> Well, mayonnaise is quite an ambiguous food stuff, really. If you make it properly, yes. it's all wobbly and, you know, not quite solid, not quite liquid. A bit like um, honey that Sartre finds disgusting because it's too viscous and it sticks to you. I was, I was, I was trying the trick of um, not thinking of that as being mayonnaise and thinking of it being as a, a tub of white paint, but it didn't really work. Um, and in relationship to the, this idea that um, that perhaps there are some dimensions of what is disgusting that are fixed um, at the same time um, there's maybe something about its potential particularly to um, to be subverted or changed um, and is is this because it is a, a aesthetic emotion or a, a effect or a, a reaction that is particularly dependent on its kind of contagious properties 
And if so, can it, can it, it kind of relating to my first question, can it actually be changed? Can what is found commonly disgusting be made not disgusting? Is that possible? And, and, and how would that occur? Can it be changed? Sorry, I'm looking straight at you, Katie. We're not expecting all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, doctors um, and surgeons especially have to overcome a sort of instinctive, it's, it feels like, disgust at what they're actually doing in order to... to one of the examples... Um, was it one that you cited about the open heart surgery mm. um, being projected onto the walls? Obviously, if you were a heart surgeon, that wouldn't be disgusting in the same way as it would be for someone who isn't. So you can kind of train your disgust. Um, and I suppose um, parents of small children have to overcome disgust at their own um, children's nappies in a way that they wouldn't for other children. So there's a kind and of do you think that's going on in, in, say, in the work of the, the authors that you were discussing? Do you think there's the... Um, desire to actually transform what is disgusting. I mean, do, maybe Charlotte Roche is, the, is the, the one which you might associate that with more. Do you think that that's an intention of the writer at all or a possible effect of the work? Some of them, I think it varies. I, mean, I have writers who use disgust in quite provocative ways, I think, to make political points without actually trying to um, claim that the things that they're representing aren't disgusting. I think Charlotte Roach is probably one of the exceptions because she's, um, I suppose, confronting people with things that they might find disgusting and presenting them as not so being. Although, of course, you have to recognise them as disgusting, otherwise the whole thing just wouldn't be provocative at all. Mm. So I think that there's a kind of interplay between those two things. Um, maybe if some of the things that she writes about um, stop being disgusting in 50 years' time, then people will read the book and be completely baffled. <laughs> I don't think that's a short-term sort of thing. I do, I do think that idea that things change, it just happens all the time. If you go back and read, like, Rabelais, like, mm. Gargantua, and... It's kind of, it's full of fart jokes, excrement, everything mm. you can think of. And mm. it clearly at the time it was just bawdy knockabout comedy. It wasn't mm. really considered disgusting, but using the same things in mm. a book now would be seen as a very calculated... And even Chaucer, you know, the books are full of sort of scurrilous... Yeah, the Canterbury Tales of, you know, <laughs> it's, kind of, and it's, it's still it's, relevant. So, so, so between, between the Middle Ages and now, you know, things have changed, and between the 19th century and now, different things become... So I think the Victorians sort of tended to suppress sex publicly, whereas we suppress death in a way that they didn't, you know, and I think... So these things do shift all the time. And, but do you think that needs to be a wider cultural process, whatever boundaries that is, or, or can it be sort of, can it be pushed, can it be provoked through particular actions, be it them within literature or within kind of visual art practices? I mean, I think it's probably important here to divide up the discussion a bit between uh, initial visceral disgust of stuff. Um, which uh, I think it was Katie was saying that children learn that very young. You know, a baby uh, throws out its carrots before it becomes disgusted, and then it starts to be disgusted, and the spewing out of the carrot takes on a different meaning then. And the, these kind of things to do with bodily functions, I think clearly all the time, we overcome these and medicine overcomes it, civilization in general wouldn't work if we didn't overcome that kind of original slimy stuff, you know. But once you get into uh, the other, you know, what is it socially yeah. that starts to be disgusting, as in the first mm -hmm. paper we heard, or when you're looking at racism or Mm -hmm. the, the horror of misogyny, you know, of uh, sex with the wrong kind of um, racial partner and so forth. These are things where you have to work politically, I think, and where that's where disgust you know, becomes a, a, a weapon. How effective, I don't know, but um, it can, a mode of irony, really, in attacking mm -hmm. uh, that kind of... Um, social uh, stigma and objection and 
so forth. Um, and I think the conference seemed to be dividing it up, you know, very well aware of that, that there's the politics of it and the, the sensuous yeah. side of it. I suppose what I was hoping to get towards, whether that would happen or not, was, was how those two things, how are, yeah. those, how are those two things yeah. bound yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. The interface between them. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think there is that idea. I mean, one is kind of there's this idea of moral disgust, you know, which many people feel about, you know, the political class at the moment, you know, which is much disgust, and that's obviously a may become a progressive too at some point. Then there's the kind of moral disgust you're talking about, which is the you know, the Daily Mail writing about Romanian immigrants, you know, and it's kind of, you have these different... So I think it's very double-edged. But they are associated, no, these yeah. two things are associated. And, um, I mean, I suppose that it would be interesting to find another way of talking about this outside of a kind of scientific discourse. I, um, I heard something on the radio. When I say the radio, I always mean Radio 4, because I listen to it too much, um, <laughs> of a... a um, a scientist who was describing it in a very kind of scientific technique who had performed an experiment that was precisely about linking visceral disgust to moral disgust. And so when you describe people doing something transgressive in a clean room or a dirty room, people are more likely to be outraged if they are in a dirty room or if there's things that are disgusting in that room. But, I mean, and that's a very limited way of kind of showing um, on a sort of literal petri dish how the two things are connected. I suppose what I'm interested in is how, you know, what the real effects might be, say, of, um, of connecting certain works we're talking about in literature or in visual art to certain <coughs> political contexts. Is the is the, that kind of act, that kind of change, that kind of um, addition of the, the aesthetic dimension to the sort of political dis disgust or political... Social. There's an interesting bit by Martha Nussbaum about disgust and shame, which precisely kind of discusses the question of whether disgust can be a progressive tool for political critique. And I think she ends up arguing that it can't really, or that it shouldn't, <laughs> that it shouldn't not, yeah, be used to make the kinds of decisions about what kind of society you want to be in that it particularly shouldn't be involved in law. And she kind of goes back into some legal history and looks at the ways that disgust has been used instead as a tool of repression. So, for example, um, in outlawing homosexuality, so I think it's um, Lord Devlin who says if the man on the Clapham omnibus would feel moral outrage or disgust at a particular thing, then that thing shouldn't be allowed in society. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Nussbaum argues that disgust isn't politically constructive because it's too much bound up with our kind of sense of self and our fear of death and all these irrational fears about things that we can't prevent. Um, and that's what makes it unreliable. So if you feel disgusted at politicians, for example, then what you do when you're disgusted is you kind of vomit out the thing and reject it and then move away. And what you should be doing is, she argues, um, engaging with it constructively. And that if there's good reasons, for example, to make anything illegal that's disgusting morally, there's usually another good reason to make it illegal on the grounds that it harms someone. She, kind of, she encountered a stumbling block when she was asked about um, net corpse. <laughs> she said, well, well, that's, <laughs> well that's a, that, that shows the value of the humanities, that we can come to these conclusions without spending millions of uh, dollars or pounds on scientific uh, uh, investigation to have an empirical and positive positivist uh, framework. I, I was wondering in terms of just shifting a little bit about the space between Craig's work and uh, Paul McCarthy's work. And because I was intrigued because I was trying to get at, well, Craig, you were doing something, you know, you're doing something very distinctive and, and ultimately, I guess what I, and, and Isabel kind of got at the question, you're abstracting to the form but in some ways, we're removing the, the, the texture, the kind of direct index, indexicality beyond that. Whereas Paul McCarthy's kind of at the other extreme. Uh, and I'm just wondering about that as a range in terms of issues of, of disgust. But then putting it in another context of what that means in the arts. Because uh, in, in some ways, uh, I understand Craig's work better as a certain kind of abstraction to form 
And in some ways, the artificiality of it, the kind of resonant covering, um, removing you, except at that level. Uh, as opposed to Paul McCarthy, where I always have a hard time figuring, well, what does this have to do with the arts? Where does this fit in, other than the fact that he's very well known and mm -hmm. very well ranked within the arts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's so, some, somewhere in between that, I think the two of you yeah. have something. Yeah. So, <laughs> duke it out. <laughs> To no problem. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, part of my thinking about Paul McCarthy's work is about how he, as an artist, is situated both within the art world, i.e., he he's quite famous in the art world. But then, if you talk, if you're talking to someone who doesn't know his work, often they'll be like, "Who?" But um, so, yeah. Part of what I'm looking at is how how his work is positioned and how he's positioned as someone who kind of makes a lot of money, is quite successful at what he does, but seemingly critiques the system in which he participates. Um, and that part of my kind of project is looking at why he moved from live performance to video, to objects, to sculpture, to huge installations, you know, Hollywood style film sets, etc. And so as the sort of budget grows, these kind of uh, pieces grow as well. Um, there's, a there's a sort of grotesqueness in that, which I'm really interested in, that I didn't I'm not really sure what to say about it yet, which is why I didn't write a paper about it. So I think, <laughs> but there's something there to talk about as well. Um, and then the other thing about, going back to the condiments, I'm sorry to talk about it again. <laughs> um, but so um, something I maybe didn't make clear is, is things like, um, it's clear from the performances, and in some performances in particular, you can see it's a bottle of ketchup, it says ketchup on it, it says mayonnaise on it. Um, but at the same time, the reason they're troubling is that they can also stand in for things like blood, menstrual blood, semen, vomit. Again, you're, that we know they're not, and sometimes we can even see the, the artificial the bottles from which they came. Um, so he's abstracting them in in that way, kind of. Um, but yeah, my problem. What troubles me about his work is that he never gives you quite enough of one thing. He sort of starts to abstract and then mm -hmm. I, yeah. <laughs> Are you kind of interested in what you were saying about the in terms of that move to video or the move to, to the frame? Because in a way I think it's a bit like I suppose in some senses I kinda of think it's similar to what I do. There's a kind of distancing. Mm -hmm. So you're distancing yourself from the thing. Um, and there is this kind of but then in the same sense there's also this uh, idea of excess. So, or, or, or too muchness. I think that's kind of what Wayne was talking about, and I think that's really interesting. The idea of something being kind of reductive, but also kind of, kind of outrageously baroque or extravagant at the same time, and then kind of playing them off each other. And I think he, like, I remember seeing um, there was a show in, uh, it, it was in New York, and it was. He, he it was showing his videos, but they they he'd done a performance and they'd left the detritus of the performance, and so you still you kind of went in and looked, watched the videos without that sense of smell, without the kind of olfactory. But then you went into this <laughs> in this space, and it just it it you just you wanted a heave as soon as you went in there because it was everywhere. The kind of it just permeated the space, and there's something he, there's something interesting about that. Again, this kind of in betweenness that I think I suppose I'm trying to kind of play with as well in relation to my kind of practice and the things that I'm interested in. So that you're kind of you're caught in between because you're kind of you're you're seduced uh, and there's a kind of sense of allure. I mean, I'm kind of interested in glamour because I think I kind of we talk about this idea of glamour being a form of blinding or or a kind of form of magic, and I think there's something about that in relation to. I suppose the kind of yeah, the, the ideas of look, this idea of thinking about artifice and and materiality and disgust, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, am I interrupting? Oh, I was just I wanted to go. <laughs> no, I mean this. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting because I, I, with with Harriet, I was wondering also because a lot of uh, with Paul McCarthy, it kind of reminds me of Jack Smith and mm -hmm. Taylor Mead in the early '60s. Mm -hmm often with some of the same material, like playing with meat and whatnot, and kind of how, wh where he fits within that as a trajectory and how, I mean, there's a, clearly a difference mm. in terms of one 
the, the way in which the work circulated was very different. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask about glamour, uh, and um, uh, somebody else mentioned kitsch, you know, and, and in uh, German Austrian culture, uh, kitsch was tremendously attacked by highbrow people in the 1930s, and Hitler's performances were actually excoriated as being kitsch of, mm. of a certain kind. And there was also a class uh, dislike of glamour and of uh, and somebody like Liberace, you know, would just have been, you know, by this Austrian writer I'm thinking of who wrote about kitsch as the evil in art. <laughs> so it's really excellent in a way that um, Liberace is being brought in as, you know, as... <laughs> <laughs> as the right on attack on that kind of, it is a kind of uh, snobbish, I think. But, I think that, but it also had a political element to yeah. it. So it's, well, I was just going to say, it. like, relating it back to that thing about the social and the political, I mean, the mm. classic essay, I suppose, was like Clement Greenberg's avant-garde and kitsch, which I mm -hmm. think came out around 1939, was it, 1940? Mm -hmm. And in that, he argued that kitsch was what is substituted for culture yeah. Um, yeah. in states where power has been removed in other spheres. So when you no longer have economic power, you no longer have political power, mm. you have kitsch as a replacement for culture and that is presented as something that the people control. So you emphasize like control of culture and democratic control of culture the more control in other spheres is removed and i think it's an interesting argument looking at the way the world is now yeah. interestingly culture becomes more participatory more democratic on the surface as all of these other rights and ways of influencing things are taken away bit by bit and so I think, I think his argument, although it's of its time and it is yeah. very snobbish, I think there is something <laughs> at core to it which is very interesting in relation to this. But yeah. say again what's so good about Liberace and Clark. <laughs> <laughs> true, I'm not I'm really... I suppose I'm... As, 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 I mean, I think, I, I think he's... A, I think it's... It's more, I suppose I'm in, like I'm, in, I'm interested in Dave Hickey's interpretation of, of I mean I think I'm interested in, I'm, in, I'm really interested in his write, in Dave Hickey's writing really. I think the way that he talks about Las Vegas and the way that he talks, so the idea, I suppose it's this idea of thinking about artifice and obviously he uses or extravagance and he uses Liberace as an example of that. Because he also, there's a really great essay where he talks about Siegfried and, and Roy and their magic show, and it's just, a, it's a, you know... So he lives in Las Vegas. Yes, he does, yeah. <laughs> um, but, I, but there's just some, so there's something about, yeah, there's just something about, I mean, for me, um, I'm, I suppose, because I think, I think both of the thing, the thing that I represent, and maybe the way that I represent it, could be deemed as, as dis, like, they're both disgusting, but they're not. So, because I, one kind of, one subverts the other, I suppose, and I'm kind of interested in what happens when when you do that. So does it kind of neutralise it, or does it does it? What does it mean to make something palatable, or make something like that you kind of are conscious of your desire of it? What does that mean, and how do you respond to that? I suppose. Uh, Thank you. Um, we're going to. Uh Open up questions from that side of the room now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Getting right into it then. Let me do. Hi, I'm not going to say too much because it's, it's me up next, but I was just kind of wanted to stake a claim really for thinking about disgust as a relation. So, I mean, in a way, all the papers did do that, although they didn't put it quite in those terms, but of course, we're always talking about a relation between a person and an object or between people and other people and and a, a relation that very often involves is very often very powerful because it's a powerful reaction to be disgusted but very often involves relations of power or attempts to reproduce relations of power and it seems to me beginning of ASCO 
and moving through some of the other examples, misogyny, class discussed in the work on Chavs and the reflections on a sort of post-Holocaust artist, um, etc. that there's a kind of always, in, in all of the papers, what, there's a commonality around trying to engage with in some way, or think for in some way, discussed as a relation which is powerful and um, involves quite often or re questions of the equality of people and things to each other. Um, so I kind of guess it's just sort of to set up where I'm going to come in, which is from a slightly different place, but it's to, it's, it's to really stake a claim, to get away from an idea that there's a kind of a real or authentic disgust reaction, and then it's a kind of cultural or social one. I would want to <laughs> think those two things together very much, and to think as soon as we start talking about disgust, you know, we might feel disgust maybe before we then communicate it. But even in the example that Katie showed from Darwin, he had to get someone to perform it. And the point I think was very powerful in her talk was discussed very often in a lot of the examples we've had today. So far as it's been performed, discussed has been, you know, something that's been, even in the audience where we're laughing or gasping at some of the revolting examples we've seen, discussed is very performative. And um, I think I'd want to trouble the idea of a kind of authentic disgust reaction as separate from the ways in which it's variously mediated and performed and enjoyed and not enjoyed and uh, pushing our boundaries, etc. So I kind of think we do have to think those two things together very much. Um, but I can talk, I'm going to talk, I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emilian. I, I know that there was another um, question from Kirsten, is that right? And then. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, um, I was thinking about, um, I kept, what was really in the back of my mind was thinking about disgust in relation to what we don't consider to be disgusting um, and, and the role of social norms um, and, and, you know, and, and forms of oppression that, are, that, that happen through social norms. And, and I guess I had a question for Katie about, um, I was really struck by um, the fact that you talked about being at this, this, um, this conference about um, women's writing and, and, and you talked about these younger women who felt, who, who couldn't, who felt disgusted by menstrual blood, and and the fact that you frame this in terms of age, mm. um, and I, I'm and I'm wondering if, if um, about this in relation to uh, may, maybe post-feminism, maybe um, changing attitudes towards what's socially acceptable in terms of the, you know the female body, and that sort of thing, and and because you, and because you also mentioned that these authors you felt they're important because you felt they were younger women and they also spoke to younger women, so I'm I'm just I'm wondering about this question about kind of changing social norms and and around around the female body and and possibly post-feminism or depoliticization around these issues of the female body. So I think so in, in some ways, this questions about about um, social norms and also forms of, of politicization and depoliticization are really very much at the back of my mind in, in terms of what we see disgusting and what we don't see disgusting. And and I would, I would agree with Imogen that that I don't think we can really think about an authentic disgust. But I'm I'm really thinking about how. I mean, the ways in which are the, these sorts of reactions are, in fact, socially constructed. I mean, I think that's a great question. You've kind of almost answered it as well. I think I phrase it in terms of age just because that's how it kind of came out in the room. And I think that some of the writers that I look at, not all of them, I mean, they're not all younger women, although they're all writing around now. Uh, but I think some of them, for example, um, well, especially Rach, she's addressing an audience who mostly have kind of grown up in a post-feminist context where they're simply not aware of what's happened, say, 20 or 30 years before. Um, obviously not necessarily the women at the conference I was at who would have done lots of reading, but um, a kind of late teens, um, early 20s readership of, of Richard's novel have never seen some of these ideas before, and so we were all reading it thinking, oh, well, this is nothing that hasn't been said in the 70s, it's just a slightly different vocabulary, and then had to step back and realise, actually, um, no, I think that there has been in that sense things have got a bit worse in terms of the way that people expect female bodies to be very sort of sanitised now and it's particularly striking in Germany because um, of course the cliche of the German context is that uh, German women don't shave their body hair uh, whereas in the last 10 years or so they, they do um, and that's been a kind of quite big cultural shift and what Roche thinks she's attacking is this kind of new um, normality of being kind of very smooth and kind of childlike and hygienic and the idea that, you know, she's, she has stated that she's attacking sort of norms of feminine hygiene that um, 
that seem to have sort of come back since the 70s, so kind of things, like some of that work has just simply been in, undone in a post-Germanist context. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered all of it, but I think, yeah, I'm, I'm basically agreeing with you, I suppose. <coughs> um, I know there's a, there's a question from the gentleman in the third row. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, to Elizabeth. Uh, you made a great uh, comment, evil flourishes in the damp. Uh, I'd love to know where that came from, but immediately it reminded me of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and uh, The Shadow of Innsmouth. I don't know if anyone's read that. Which is set in this decaying, damp village populated by people who are slowly turning into sort of fish-like creatures or slimy. So the whole thing's all about the horror of the, of the disgusting, fishy, slimy mm. people. So uh, that's another genre I think, you know, dis yeah. disgust can move into the horror genre. Yes, uh, and I think that uh, the novel I was talking about, uh, not in, as in the extreme of Lovecraft, but it, it certainly is eerily uncanny uh, the way dry land and wet land are uh, intermingling and the way in which um, precisely the creatures that in Leviticus are excoriated, uh, lizards and slugs and so on. So it sounds as if she maybe had Lovecraft <laughs> in mind, you know. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I'm going to take this yeah, lady back there. Um, I actually wanted to kind of pose a question that's um, getting away from a kind of actual feeling of disgust in a way. And I kind of wanted to bring up like this idea of um, being kind of interested in and fascinated by and curious about things that are disgusting so, to an extent that kind of actually removes you from that, that feeling of disgust in the first place. Um, so, kind of our obsession with with um, looking at things that are disgusting, or kind of being really interested in people's um, excessiveness, or I'm just kind of aware of my own interest in things that maybe are disgusting, or um, looking at particular things I actually don't feel disgusted hardly ever. I'm aware of bodily wise, just because I'm instantly so interested in the thing that is supposedly disgusting in the first place. And I think um, to think about Craig's work and Paul McCartney's work is that's part of it, I think, with when it's kind of put in a visual arts context. Um, yeah, kind of more of a thought than a proper question. <laughs> well, I, it's an interesting issue in terms of, in some ways, the narrow parameters of what is accepted as beautiful is, is, and, the, uh, and, and, and I had that as a question in terms of when I was thinking about Osco in terms of disgust and thinking well I don't think any of that's disgusting I'm very intrigued and engaged with it um, or the self portraitures of Laura Aguilar who's uh, almost morbidly obese um, but I find some of these really to be quite stunningly beautiful images and she's part of that she's you know and I think that's part of what art does uh, outside of kind of fairly narrow uh, conventions or traditions of uh, what we see as beauty it shifts back and this may be part of the relationship to discuss um, to our eye and to our sense of how we can engage with work and I think with someone like Paul McCarthy at least for me, there's a challenge to that. You really have to, and, and I think Harriet, God, you have to work at it. You have to understand where your reactions are coming from. And, and I was very moved by your uh, admission there that uh, you know you you've had been hesitant to see this with other people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know that kind of. I try, I try not to let people see that I'm watching it on my laptop in the library because it's, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It, it's just challenging <laughs> for me as well as the thing I'm watching. It means that I am, it, it, it yeah. transfers to me as a subject. As but well the, and, and the arts have had this in terms of, uh, say, in the film avant-garde, duration. Like, 
can I get you to sit there for eight hours and look at something yeah. and just be looking and, and even though there's very little to look at, say so mm -hmm. Warhol's Because mm. uh, uh, it might mean that you get bored as well, which is another thing, like yeah. another thing. Rather than be like really engaged and disgusted, you could just be really bored. Well, that, that, was, <laughs> that was a breakthrough for me when I was first kind of trying to engage with avant-garde film and I talked to one of the kind of main people. I thought, what do you do? Like, uh, and this, well, you zone out, you get bored, you become <laughs> aware that you're bored, you come back to the film, you know. And, and it's, it's really being attentive more than anything. Uh, rather than tying that sense of attention to what merits uh, attention or what is considered appropriate for attention. Um, well, we are going to have to break now. I'm sorry, but I'm, I, I hope there will be there will be chance for discussion after the next session and then at the end of the day also. Um, but we've got 20 minutes. Is that right? Yeah, we've got 20 minutes till, till 5 p.m. and then we'll, we'll kick off again. Some ketchup outside for everybody.